Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O Good One. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming out this evening. Uh, it, it looks from here that, like you guys have some sun. We have lots of rain and thunderstorms today, so uh, I hope you're enjoying the weather. And um, yeah, I'm glad to be back with you after a few weeks away. So this evening we're going to I'm going to continue what Father John uh, began a few weeks ago. Um, which is looking at the Sunday Gospel, but um, uh, by the light of the commentaries of St. John Chrysostom. Uh, very wonderful commentaries. Uh, we know the, the stories uh, surrounding his writing of the commentary of, uh, commentaries on the epistles of St. Paul, whereby the saint actually uh, was seen to have appeared to him and was sort of whispering in his ear. Um, but we know that St. John, being given the title, the Golden Mouth, uh, Chrysostomus, that, uh, that everything that he says has very great benefit for us and for the Church, and, uh, and especially his commentaries, uh, because in many ways they're very accessible. So um, I'm going to stick with that this evening as well, and hopefully we can draw out some things that maybe you haven't thought of before. Uh, and then if, if you have any questions. Uh, we're hoping also to mention a word or two about uh, the prophet uh, Elias, who we celebrate on Sunday. Whether, whether I'll get to that or not, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, you can also bear that in mind because it pertains to the Sunday. So, very good. Uh, I'm just going to begin by reading uh, the Gospel for Sunday. It's St. Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 9, verse 1. At that time, Jesus entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. So I think this is a fairly familiar uh, gospel that, uh, that we have before us. And uh, I'll just start right into St. John. Now what we'll notice with St. John is, whereas in some of his homilies he sort of you know, picks a theme and kind of carries, carries on with it throughout, in this gospel, what I noted was certainly that he he sort of proceeds through the passage, and it's more that he's sort of speaking of, of things of interest rather than focusing only on on one topic. And so, because we're following his commentary, we'll uh, we'll follow what he does, so that I hope you get a bit of a sense of um, how his own commentary proceeds, and then you can always go and uh, look at it. So, in terms of which homily this is. This is homily 29 of uh, St. John's commentary on the Gospel of St. Matthew. So St. John begins by establishing which city is being spoken about. We hear 
And Jesus entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Uh, well, which one is his own city? St. John uh, says, by his own city, he means Capernaum. For that which gave him birth was Bethlehem, and that which brought him up, Nazareth. And that which had him continually inhabiting it was Capernaum. And so St. John mentions this not uh, just by way of sort of setting the stage, but he makes explicit that he's doing it for another important reason, uh, and so it's important to bear in mind. Uh, the reason why St. John is mentioning this is so that we'll not confuse this miracle uh, with uh, or so that we'll, we'll know for certain which miracle it is that we're speaking about, which healing of uh, the paralytic. Uh, we find this miracle recounted in both the Gospel of St. Mark and the Gospel of St. Luke. And he wants to um, distinguish this uh, chiefly from the miracle which we commemorated a few weeks ago, uh, which was the, the miracle of the paralytic at the pool of uh, Siloam, if you remember, uh, the one where the angel troubles the water and the first person who gets in the water uh, has their particular diseases cured. And, um, and it's I, I, sort of, I guess you could say, a coincidence or providential, but when I was looking to see what the parallel, you know, where exactly the parallel uh, pass this passage was in the other Gospels, uh, I just pulled up a website, you know, online, uh, because the, there's sites that sort of have this where you can you can look at all four Gospels and it'll show you where the different passages are sort of found verse-wise. And as I was looking at it, um, you know, I looked at this one in Matthew, I looked at Mark, I looked at Luke. When I read the one in, in John, I was surprised, because I'd already started reading St. John's commentary, I was surprised to find out that... Uh, on this particular website, they had actually confused this miracle uh, that St. John is saying with the, the miracle that we said of the angel troubling the water a few weeks ago. So I thought it, it sort of it particularly illustrated the point, even though one might have thought, how could anyone confuse the two miracles? And the reason why I say that is because, as St. John says, he gives us uh, a list of sort of you know reasons why we ought not to confuse these two. He says, this paralytic was different from that one who was set forth in, uh, in the John's Gospel. For that one lay at the pool, but this one in Capernaum. That man had his infirmity 38 years and was in a state destitute of protectors and of friends. But this had some to take care of him, who also took him up and carried him. And to this he saith, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But to that one in John's Gospel, he says, Wilt thou be made whole? And the other he healed uh, on the Sabbath day. But this miracle that we're talking about this evening uh, was not on the Sabbath. Uh, otherwise, the Jews would have laid this also to Jesus' charge. And in the case of this man, they were silent about this. But in the case of the other, they were instantly persecuting him. And so... Having already read this in St. John, I thought, could someone really confuse these two paralyt paralytics uh, from the, you know, these two different accounts? But lo and behold, uh, what we see is when we don't look to the Holy Fathers, uh, these are exactly the kinds of errors that we can fall into. And this is precisely the, the error that I found on this website. Whether they did it by accident or whether they were indeed confused, um, I think it illustrated, you know, both St. John, the justification for St. John talking about it, but also, you know, the important thing for us, which is one of the reasons why we look to the Holy Fathers, because they make clear things for us that aren't always clear, or they, uh, or things that we take to be clear, they actually give a totally different meaning to it that we haven't either thought of or that we've, uh, we've read mistakenly especially in light of uh, modern preconceptions about uh, different topics. Now, St. John um, goes on next to talk about 
uh, so he moves from that sort of as an introduction, let's say, and he moves to begin to talk about why our Lord came over on a ship when he's capable of walking on water and such things as that. And he points out, uh, firstly, it's a mark of our Lord's humility that he doesn't go around sort of displaying his glory for no apparent reason other than because he can. He's always very measured in the miracles that he performs, and he performs them always with a purpose. Uh, generally speaking, the purpose of leading people to salvation. And so um, St. John just sort of mentions that in passing. And he goes on to say something else that I found connected to this that, um, that I found particularly interesting. St. John says, And this I have said not without purpose, that is, Christ uh, not taking the boat and his humility, lest anyone should think there is a discrepancy... Oh, sorry... Um, um, quoting to the wrong spot. Um, right here, sorry. And again he entered into the ship and passed over when he might have gone over a foot. For it was his will not to be always doing miracles, that he might not injure the doctrine of his humanity. And so this was something that struck me as particularly significant because I hadn't thought of it in this light before you know that there would be instances where our Lord would intentionally you know you might say act more human uh, than he could precisely so that um, we would have passed on to us the correct teaching about him and so that the disciples who were following him at the time would have that also passed on to them uh, and, and that understanding and you you know it doesn't take much, um, we don't have to think very long to understand why that might be the case. Now, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in connection to something else St. John says a little bit further down, so um, I don't want to, uh, to dwell too much on it right now, but, um, but just sort of to bear in mind basically uh, this and also in response to to the these sort of uh, criticisms of those uh, who criticize him both for doing things and for not doing things and we see this in the scriptures we see he's being criticized for healing people um, but uh, you know but then he's also being criticized because he's not fasting or you know and you see this sort of dichotomy constantly everyone's sort of watching him with these kind of expectations. Um, and the expectations are very much conditioned by the fact that in the estimation of especially the Pharisees who are the main people sort of, sort of judging his actions um, this is only a man who's doing these things and so they look at his actions sort of accordingly uh, rather than looking at the sort of fruit of what's actually taking place in front of their eyes and so um, as we'll see sort of further down in terms of not injuring his doctrine of his humanity and why he does certain things and doesn't, you know, show his Godhead, it, it also sort of struck me, I don't know if you've heard this or maybe you've thought it yourself, but uh, I've had it mentioned to me explicitly that, uh, you know, there's people who claim that Christ does not explicitly claim to be God, that he is God. I've had people tell me this. You know, and you probably have too, and you can read authors who say this, Christ never said that he was God, and, and things like that. And I think that, as we'll see a little bit further down, that this might actually be, you know, um, that Christ doesn't sort of uh, beat people over the head with the fact that he is God, or doesn't trumpet it uh, in the way some people maybe want him to, maybe have has a connection to this idea of not injuring the doctrine of his humanity. And so I want us to sort of at least have that in the in the back of our mind as uh, as we continue to go through this. Now, um, one other thing I, I just wanted to mention, I guess, before we, we got into the thick of things, uh, is also because it's it is connected to this is the theme of contradictions in the scriptures, and and that it both ties to Saint John beginning by differentiating which paralytics. And for what reason? Um, part of the quote I was starting to go into uh, a moment ago was that St. John is saying, lest that anyone should think there's a discrepancy in the scriptures themselves. And this is, 
this is something that we have to wrestle with, I think, as, as Orthodox Christians, uh, as those who confess uh, that Christ is perfect God and perfect man. Because being perfect God and perfect man, many times in the scriptures, if one takes uh, one verse or the other in isolation and outside of context, um, you can say, see, this is a contradiction. Because the fact of the matter is, to be both God and man, uh, from a human perspective, from a human, uh, from human logic, is a contradiction. How can these two things uh, be together? But this is the mystery of the incarnation. And uh, in light of the revelation of such a mystery, we can begin to approach it in a kind of rational way to understand it. But it isn't something that human logic um, would naturally arrive at because it seems like a contradiction. And there's various aspects and things like this in the scriptures. And um, I heard recently in the last uh, little while some things that I was reading and in, uh, in an encounter with someone you know, they were struggling with why are there many accounts in the Bible and not just one account? Wouldn't that have been the sort of straightforward uh, and easy easy way to go about things? Um, rather than having this sort of opportunity for people to say, well, you know, your scriptures contradict them. Well, they don't teach Christ as God. Well, they do teach Christ as God, but he's not a man or, you know, things like that. And um, in particular, I've sort of seen of late that um, this is what Muslims often ask uh, about the Bible, or as I have already said, others who want to sort of disprove the scriptures and say, you know, look at all these sort of contradictions. Um, but uh, I came upon something very interesting recently. It's a public debate of uh, a, the new martyr, Father Daniel Sisoyev. I don't know if some of you have, have heard of him. He lived in Russia, and uh, he was killed by... Um, uh, a Muslim man, I think it was in 2009 maybe, maybe a little bit earlier than that, sometime around there, and, uh, and largely because of the missionary work that he was doing uh, amongst uh, the Muslim community there. Uh, you know, many, many, many Muslims were turning to Christ, and it was in large part uh, due to things like this public debate that he, that he had. Uh, now that's just a way of background, but in particular, um, I wanted to mention his response to someone who sort of raised this question. Why does the Bible have many authors? Uh, aren't these contradictions in the scriptures? And, um, you know, doesn't it make more sense that there would be uh, a single author? And Father Daniel says, undoubtedly there are no contradictions here. And he says, for example, if we hear in the court the witnesses' testimonies which describe various events, events that take place at the same time, we do not say that the witnesses' testimonies have discrepancies or contradictions, that is, simply because there is more than one narration of the event. Um, so it is in this case, too. If one evangelist says that one woman came before dawn, another saying that another woman came at daybreak, and another evangelist saying that uh, a woman came after sunrise, uh, i.e., they're testifying to different facts, all of which separately took place. And so the Gospels are about cumulative, cumulative and complementary accounts, not about contradictory testimonies. The fact is that the Gospels' descriptions entirely complement each other and form a connected text. And so um, I think this is something very important important to sort of bear in mind uh, because it is a sort of simplistic argument that people will bring to us as a reason for you know why the Bible isn't true uh, and things like that um, and, and in this Father Daniel is clearly following the teachings of St. John Chrysostom and uh, St. Gregory Paul of Maas and lots of people St. Theophon the Recluse who directly sort of deal with this if uh, I would recommend you know that even if if you're really interested in these commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew, that you look at St. John's very first homily in the commentary, um, and you'll see that he applies the same logic. He, uh, his point is that the testimony of the Gospels is stronger precisely because it was not only written by one person. 
And so just like in the court case, the, the example Father Daniel uses, you know, with four witnesses all painting a full picture of events, this is a stronger testimony than the single testimony of one witness who may or may not have ulterior motives. You know, they may decide to lie. They may have reasons for distorting the truth. This isn't so easy to do when we have uh, the testimony of, uh, you know, very many uh, people. And so St. John will say, what then? Was not, uh, quoting the, the people who sort of, um, who raised this as an issue. What then was not one evangelist sufficient to tell all? And St. John replies, one indeed was sufficient, but if there be four that write, not at the same times, nor in the same places, neither after having met together and conversed with one another, and then they speak all things as it were out of one mouth, this becomes a very great demonstration of the truth. And so I think this is uh, something significant that we need to, to, to keep in mind, that uh, the strength of the accounts are actually stronger um, because of the fact that they are so consistent, even if at certain points they appear to be contradictory because we're not understanding the, the context of, of what's going on, maybe, or of what's being described. And so, um, anyway, so bear, bear that in mind, and uh, I think it's sort of, uh, it will be important. So, now, St. John enters our theme by giving us the context of the miracle, right? Uh, we all heard it, I just read it to you. It's very basic. The the friends of this man bring him on his pallet, as it were, on his bed. And uh, our Lord, seeing their faith, says, uh, you know, uh, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And, um, and what we don't see in this account, which we do see in the other two accounts in Mark and Luke, is that the crowd was, uh, the, the place was so full, the crowd was so large, that they actually cut a, a hole in the roof. And the friends lowered him him down on his bed. And so this is that same miracle. Many of us are familiar with it um, from, that, from that bit of context. And so St. John sort of begins by connecting it to these other passages, uh, but then he brings up the sort of the overarching prerequisite for all of our Lord's miracles, generally speaking, throughout all of the New Testament, and, and why our Lord works the miracles that he does. As we said, he didn't choose to walk on water he chose to ride the boat, you know, to come to, to this place. He doesn't work miracles arbitrarily. He always does them for a purpose. And one of the main purposes is for eliciting the response of faith and for encouraging people and drawing this faith out of them. And so the, the main prerequisite that we always see our Lord doing is drawing this faith out of, his, uh, out of those who he's going to work the miracle for before he actually accomplishes the miracle. And in this case, we see the same thing, except we see it, interestingly enough, in, um, in some ways more dramatic, in that it was his, seeing his friend's faith, our Lord uh, forgives his sins. And uh, um, this has a parallel to, actually, this is a very strong sort of argument for... Um, why it is that we baptize infants. Um, if we understand anything about baptism, when, a, when the child is brought for baptism, he's not brought, uh, he or she is not brought um, by themselves, but they're actually brought with, you know, what? Godparents. They're brought with some kind of a sponsor who will make the, the promises of faith on this child's behalf um, because the child's not in a position yet to make those those promises on their own, and uh, and then in an appropriate time the child will, uh, having been reared up in the faith, will then have the responsibility to, to sort of to uh, to take over those those promises themselves and to sort of live the faith. But here is one of the one of the testimonies in the scriptures that sort of point to why we can do something like that. Um, it was for the sake of the faith of his friends, for the sake of the faith of his, you know, sponsors, as it were. And who knows why uh, this was the case. At least, you know, it may be written somewhere more uh, in depth uh, in the Father somewhere, but off the top of my head, I'm not, I haven't encountered anything, you know, uh, you know, of why 
it was the friends. Now Saint John will say the the man the par paralytic also had faith because if he didn't, he wouldn't have let them carry him there. He would have spoken up and said, "No, I'm not going in here." Um, and so that he is sort of complicitly demonstrating faith as well by allowing them to do this. Um, but you know, who, who knows the sort of the context? But I think it's uh, it's a sort of a wonderful testimony to the way that the Lord works. In the same reason, you know, how God can change other people in our lives, for example, or people that we know who maybe have no relation to God, who maybe hate God, who maybe don't believe in God, um, and yet for the sake of our prayers for those people, God can work miracles. Even you know sometimes not directly as a result of the faith of the person, and so I, this is a it's a great testimony to the truth of the fact that we're a body and that we're a community, and that even uh, we're yes we're the body of Christ, but even we're the community of the human race, uh, and in that sense we're also you know one body in as much as we're one nature. Uh, and and we have a responsibility and an accountability to the people around us, even those in our communities, you know, uh, who have nothing to do with the faith, uh, the people we've never met. Uh, and we should think about this, and we should be praying for it, and we see it reflected in in the way the petitions unfold in the divine liturgy. You know, uh, if you sort of look at that closely, you'll see the way in which we, you know, we, we're praying for the whole world, we're praying for our cities, we're praying for you know, the farmers were praying for, we're gathering everyone up in prayer. And, uh, and so it's, it's very important to see that. So now, having sort of established that, St. John doesn't spend a lot of time talking in this particular homily on faith. Um, he mentions it, he moves on. He spends a lot more time actually speaking about our Lord's humility, funny enough, uh, as the thing progresses. And, um, and he keeps sort of coming back to the theme in which, despite the fact that our Lord uh, is the God-man, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, uh, he, he, he not only humbles himself to have become a man, which in and of itself is just this, you know, unbelievable humbling, you know, for God to become his creature. It would be like for you to become you know, the report that you wrote, you know, this week for work, or, you know, the chair that you built in shop class, you know, uh, and, and that's not even comparable. The distance between, between a creature and the uncreated God is infinitely more vast, and yet, you know, for love of that creation, uh, you know, Christ becomes uh, man, or, or the second person of the Holy Trinity becomes man in order to, in order to save us. And so, but, just, but even in that act of humility, St. John is pointing out that our Lord goes much further, because even his life on earth, even amongst men, he didn't come, you know, to live amongst men as a king. He came in, in sort of abject poverty, as it were, you know, born in a cave because, you know, they, they couldn't have an inn you know, born in an animal's food trough. I mean, by today's standards, can you imagine what what kind of poverty do we view that to be? Uh, and yet our Lord decided not to come today, you know, to Canada, where even in poverty, he would still have been much uh, richer, let's say, than in the situation maybe that he found himself in. Um, uh, but he certainly didn't come as a king. He chose even the humble road amongst human beings not just the humble road of becoming a human. And so St. John does speak quite a bit about this, uh, but he it's a very interesting way in which he shows the sort of balance in, in the ways in which our Lord demonstrates humility without ever denying his true nature. And there's something very profound in there that I think that we, that we need to take from that, that, um, that this... That the life of humility, the life of um, of self-abasement in some ways, of sacrifice for others, of putting others before ourselves, um, doesn't necessarily require that we somehow fall into some kind of bizarre notions of self-loathing or something like that. 
or that when we sacrifice ourselves for others, that um, we're somehow denying, you know, what it is to be a human being, uh, or strange ideas like that. And so I think it's important to sort of see that if God Himself, the highest of all beings, is able to demonstrate this great virtue of making Himself the servant of all, um, how much easier ought it to be for us, um, and difficult as it is. But as I said, St. John points out that. Um, he says, for as much then as they had evinced so great faith, he also evinces his one power with all authority, absolving his sins and signifying in all ways that he is equal in honor with him that begat him. But, to stop the quote, but, uh, but he doesn't do it in a way that's sort of hitting people over the head. You know, he does it very, uh, very quietly. In many cases, he says, don't go tell anyone about this. He does it in sort of private homes, like in this particular case. He doesn't begin with the extravagant miracle. He begins with humility in order to sort of teach us not to pursue after the glory of the praise of human beings, not to pursue after success and, uh, and being liked uh, and being you know, thought well of in this life and in this world. Um, but to put God first and to put the works of God first. Um, what strikes St. John as particularly significant in this is how, as he says, in this sort of balance between his humility and manifesting his glory, Jesus constrains his very enemies to confess his equality and honor, and by their own mouth he makes it manifest. For he, to signify his indifference to honor, for there stood a great company of spectators shutting up the entrance, whereby also they let the man, the paralytic, down from above, uh, did not straightway hasten to heal the visible body. That is, as I was saying, he didn't do the striking visible miracle. Um, but our Lord takes his occasion from them, and he first healed that which is invisible, the soul, by forgiving the paralytic sins which indeed saved the paralytic, but brought no great, great glory to Christ himself. The Pharisees themselves, though, troubled by their malice and wishing to assail him, caused even against their own will uh, what was done to occur and to be made public. That is, the sort of uh, the visible miracle, which appears more significant, though in reality, as St. John will point out through this homily, is actually the much less significant miracle. The healing of the soul is a much greater miracle by far than any, any sort of physical healing that a person can receive. Now, uh, this very public, this extravagant miracle of, of healing the man's paralysis, um, as I said, is in the context of our Lord sort of uh, showing humility, of our Lord sort of having knowledge of all things and arranging all things so that by the actions even of his enemies, he is able to manifest his divinity um, through his actions and through the, the miracles that he was going to perform. Now, um, St. John will sort of, you know, make a point of saying that while our Lord, as I've said, avoids drawing unnecessary attention to himself, he never denies who he actually is when pressed to do so. And I think in this we need to take a lesson, okay? Um, you know, we do works, as the scriptures say, not to be seen by men, but to be seen by God who is in heaven, not to receive a reward, reward from, you know, from people, but from God. Um, but that being said, there are times when, um, for the sake of the glory of God, we won't let our works be hidden, or we'll make confession of, of our works to other people when they bring them up to us. Um, the important thing, though, in doing that, and the, 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 the thing where we really need to catch ourselves, is that we need to be giving God the glory. So you do something nice for someone, 
and someone compliments you for it. You, you went a little bit extra, you went a little bit further you know, with work, or you helped out a coworker or something like that. And they're really praising you. Right there, there's this temptation you know, to pride, to vainglory, to desire this kind of thing because it feels good you know, to have your ego stroked, as it were. Um, but what we need to be doing is, at least inward, if not outward, uh, turning these things to say, you know, glory to God. These are moments when we turn it to say, uh, within ourselves, if we can't say to the, to the other person, well, you know, God has given me these gifts, so they're not mine, and I owe them to other people, you know, or, you know, thank God that he allowed this situation to work out so that I was able to do something extra for this person, you know, when maybe many times I, I wouldn't otherwise. And so in all of our actions, you know, no matter what they are, um, we can find this way to follow our Lord's humility, even when we do the greatest of things, um, because we can always find ways to, uh, you know, to attribute them to God. And as I said, sometimes you'll be able to do that explicitly to a person. Other times you won't be able to, you know, for various reasons. Um, but you can always do it within yourself. And you can always offer this up and, and thank God. And so this is where I say, generally speaking, we try not to have our works be known by other people, precisely because we don't want to be praised for them. Uh, but there are times when it is, you know, it is right and important to sort of acknowledge these these good things, and also know, you know, realizing that it's these kinds of good things, these good deeds, that other people will sort of uh, see us as being, you know, uh, well, as the scriptures say. Uh, let your light so shine out from you that um, uh, that people may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know that this can have the positive effect that people can say, why, why, why does this person always act nice even when the most crummy things are going on in life? You know, how come this person can always dredge out a smile? You know, even when I know tough things are going on in their lives. You know, why, you know, why can they always keep their composure, or why do they always try to keep their composure? When you know, when maybe you know, uh, from a worldly perspective, they should act differently. Um, and so these are the kinds of ways in which we can kind of balance out both this humility of the Lord, but also not denying uh, what's taken place as long as we're attributing it and, and offering it up to the glory of God. And so uh, Saint John points points out very insightfully, I think, upon their murmuring, that is the Pharisees. And saying, this man blasphemeth, who can forgive sins but God only? Let us see what our Lord saith. Did he indeed take away the suspicion? Uh, that is, if he were not equal, he should have said, why are you fixed upon this idea which you ought not to be fixed upon? I am far from this power that you're attributing to me. But now he said none of these things, but quite the contrary. He hath both affirmed and confirmed them by his own voice as well as by the performance of the miracle. Thus it appearing that his saying certain things of himself gave disgust to his hearers, that is to say, um, you know, because if he said these things directly to people, they would be disgusted. They would take up stones to, to stone him, maybe, in some cases. He affirms what he had to say concerning himself by using others. As St. John says in this particular gospel passage, by using his own enemies. His own enemies set it up for him to work the miracle so that people can't sort of uh, blame him, as it were, for chasing after glory um, and for sort of setting himself up. To, to be all of these things, despite the fact that he doesn't have the works to back them up, let's say. Um, it's also a way to avoid, in just a human sense, people being bitter and resenting him. Uh, it's much easier for people to, to swallow these good things of our Lord when they, they come about more naturally. We all know what it's like, despite the fact uh, of how good a person might be, when you're always hearing from that person how good they are and how well they've done and how many successes they have in their life, even if you, you know, agree with the person and even if you love the person, you know, it can become wearisome, let alone if there's a reason for there to be some kind of bitterness or envy 
or hatred, as we see in the case of, uh, of our Lord's miracles. And so, uh, St. John continues, So what is truly marvelous is that, not by his friends only, but also by his enemies, he does this. For this is the excellency of our Lord's wisdom. By his friends on the one hand, when he said, I will, be thou clean. And when he said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. But by his enemies, in this case. For because they had said, no man can forgive sins, but God only. Our Lord subjoined, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power to forgive sins upon the earth. They set it up, and he just responds to it. Then he says to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And not here only, St. John says, but also in other cases when they were saying, for example, for a good work, we stoned thee not. If you remember, uh, they had taken up stones, and he said, for which of the good works are you stoning me? And they say, for good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest th thyself God. And neither in that instance, St. John continues, did he put down this opinion. He doesn't, he doesn't say, look, no, you've got it all wrong here. You know, you've got the wrong understanding about me. You know, you're thinking about things in the wrong way. I'm not God. You know, he doesn't say that. Rather, he again confirms it saying, if I do not the works, if I don't do the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, believe, uh, don't believe in me, but believe in the works themselves. And so he finds a way to sort of be continually pointing people to sort of see the deeper meaning of really what's going on here and what he's doing. Uh, in very sort of significant ways, and that this is what our Lord is doing sort of throughout. And so th this sort of second aspect, you know, the first aspect we said was, or that I mentioned was when St. John mentioned, sometimes he doesn't work miracles because he wants people to still, uh, you know, see and understand that he's human. And so at, at this point, I think, you know, we should also be thinking about these claims of some, you know, modernists, especially, you know, non-Orthodox, amongst non-Orthodox theologians, who want to suggest that, you know, Christ didn't claim to be God. Well, we've just heard a bunch of passages where he had the clear opportunity, as St. John points out, to clear things up. It would have made things a lot easier for him. He wouldn't have ended up on a cross, you know. But he precisely didn't do that. He took their words and he turned them back on them as a confession of who he actually was. Um, you know, but we also we do see this sort of almost in ways you would say are explicit. You know, in John's Gospel we hear, "I and my Father are one." Now it's tough to get a lot more explicit than that. You know, um, but again we read, for example, him saying. Uh, you know, I am. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, this name, I am, was a clear Old Testament name for God, which is why when we read it, when we read it, we don't necessarily understand why are people getting all upset. But the Jews picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy because they understood that this was a name for God. And so, um, you know, in light of Saint John's. Uh, statements about the preserving of the doctrine of his humanity, uh, you know, a thought of, sort of occurred to me that I had really never thought of, because I had often thought about this point, having people mention it to me, you know, why doesn't Christ say it more explicitly? Um, and I, I couldn't help but think in light of, of this point he makes about humanity, that maybe this is precisely the reason why our Lord doesn't overstate the point about his divinity, why he's constantly... Um, you know, pointing them to his uh, his actions rather than his words, because in many ways his actions, as we all say, actions speak louder than words. But also because they're a little bit easier for people to swallow, um, because they're very difficult to argue with when he's doing these you know amazing works of power, amazing works of healing, uh, and amazing works of of transformation. And so. Um, you know, I, I thought it was sort of a really interesting, interesting point. If the next time someone said, "Well, how come Christ doesn't say it clearly? Why doesn't he say clearly that he's God?" You know, 
for us to say, well, as St. John Chrysostom says, maybe it's because he didn't want to undermine the fact that he's also perfectly human. And if he focused too much on the fact that he was you know, perfectly God, that people, especially people who are first receiving the faith, would have become, you know, confused, would have become, you know, deceived even more easily. I mean, there were, there were groups in the early church who believed, you know, that, uh, that that Christ wasn't a man, that he was, you know, that he was, you know, fully divine. There's lots of different heresies that um, that sort of approach this teaching in some way, you know, more or less. Uh, it's very appealing to the Gnostics. Who want to basically say that you know the body is evil and only the spirit is good? This is a, a teaching they really could have you know you know sunk their their teeth into as it were if the point was overstated. But again, it shows sort of the perfection I think of the scriptures that it preserves and doesn't undermine the fact that Christ is both perfect God and perfect man, and that we can clearly see both of these aspects of Him. And you know this is exactly what we celebrated. Uh, this past Sunday, when we commemorated the fathers of the the Fourth Ecumenical Council, and so again, the way in which the Holy Fathers can just in just one small line or one small point can really illumine something for us, you know, if if our you know if we're reading them and if we're uh, if our minds are there, um, because this is just an aspect, you know, despite the fact that for many years maybe you've read the scriptures that hadn't ever occurred to me. Now. Um, back a little bit to the, the Pharisees as these sort of unwitting instruments of revealing both the equality of Christ with his Father um, by the performance of another public miracle, but interestingly enough, they set it up for Christ to, to, to work an even stronger miracle and one that was completely directed at their own heart and hearts. Uh, Christ does something that only God can claim to do, as uh, as St. John points out, which is see into a human heart. You know, that's part of what's so significant about this passage is, you know, they didn't speak aloud their doubts. Christ read their thoughts, saw what was in their heart, and spoke and then worked the miracle. You know, this should have been an even uh, stronger testimony for them. They should have, the Pharisees should have fallen down before him right then, understanding what this meant of all of all people, even if the simple people didn't understand. St. John says, in this case indeed, he discloses another sign, and that no small one, of his own Godhead, and of his equality and honor with the Father. For whereas they said, to unbind sins pertains to God only, he not only unbinds sins, but also before this, he makes another kind of display in a thing which pertained to God only, the publishing of the secrets in the heart. For neither had they uttered what they were thinking. For behold, certain of the scribes, it saith, said within themselves, as I said to you, this man blasphemeth. And our Lord sort of calls them on that. St. John continues, but that it belongs to God only to know men's secrets. Hear what saith the prophet, thou most entirely alone, O God, knowest the hearts. And again, God trieth the hearts and reigns. And the prophet Jeremiah says, The heart is deep above all things, and it is man, uh, and it is man, and who shall know him? And man shall look on the face, but God on the heart. And by many things one may see that to know what is in the mind and in the heart belongs to God alone. And so this is sort of a clear, the clear implications here is that he is God in light of what they just, the, what the Pharisees just sort of pointed out, equal to the Father that begat him. And so, um, you know, it's, it's one thing for the people not to have necessarily picked up on this, but these were the Pharisees who spent all their day long in reading of the law, in reading of the Old Testament scriptures. They knew all of these things. I mean, you can see this in various places where they debate, for example, where Christ is going to be born, and they say, oh, find me a prophet out of Nazareth, read the scriptures. Well, they knew the scriptures well enough to know, for example, that there was no, you know, you know, verse that would say he was born there. Of course, we know it's because he was born in Bethlehem. They didn't know that at the time, but the point is that these Pharisees know the scriptures. They know this stuff about God. 
and yet, um, you know, the response that we see in this passage, we don't see it uh, overflowing in humility. We don't see them becoming sort of apologetic. Uh, and St. John will give us a bit of an explanation a little bit further down as to why that is. But I couldn't help but think, you know, how often does God do this for us? You know, we, we say, well, we try to practice our faith and, you know, we go to church and, you know, we're the, the sort of religious people of our, of our day or something like that. And, uh, you know, we're not unbelievers. That's why we're, generally speaking, why we're here and why we're doing the kinds of studies that we're doing. And yet I just, you know, I couldn't help but wonder how many times that, uh, you know, God is trying to sort of work these same kinds of miracles that ought to be really obvious to us, um, and yet we sort of fail to, to sort of see them, or we fail to, you know, to, to grasp the sort of full meaning of things because of, our, you know, the sort of preconceptions maybe that we have, or you know, more unfortunately, the kinds of sins and passions, you know, that that end up kind of blinding us and not being able to, to sort of see these things. And I thought of it much more in the context even of not that they encounter and that we decide not to accept them or we sort of wriggle our way out of it, as it were, um, but more in, in, like, what are all the things in everyday life that pass us by? All of the blessings, all of the miracles that, that God is working in our lives you know, and trying to, to sort of reveal to us um, that we just miss because, you know, we're too busy or because we have, you know, other things that are more important right at this particular moment, you know, whether it's relaxing or whether it's, you know, uh, you know, going grocery shopping or paying a bill or something like that. You know, all of these things that at the end of the day we really want to, you know, are they like, or are they even really worth it? You know, if you knew that you were going to experience this, these kinds of miracles of God seeing in your heart, you know, is it really worth uh, that television program or uh, or that you know great novel maybe that that you wanted to read or something, rather than a little bit of extra time in prayer, a little bit of extra time reading the scriptures or you know reading Saint John or someone like that to try to uh, allow these blinders to come down. I, again, I just thought it was something that uh, that, that when we when we hear it this Sunday, uh, that maybe it'll stand out to us the, this kind of the great miracle that the Lord works, and that we won't hear the Lord say to us, as He said to them, "Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? You know, why are you letting these things get in the way of all of the good things I'm trying to to give to you?" Um, you know, and, and that kind of yearning that he has for us. Because there's one thing St. John will also point out about the way our Lord deals with the Pharisees, is that he says he deals with them with great gentleness. And again, having heard this passage so many times, I never really thought of it in that, in that light. You know, of the fact that, you know, the, the Lord, you know, he calls them out, but I mean, he, he doesn't really give it to them, you know. Uh, not as he does even in other passages, for example where we hear the, you know, woe, you scribes and Pharisees, blind guides, all that kind of stuff, which is a different point in his ministry. Um, but that he is still dealing, even in this case where he's rebuking them and trying to bring them out of their stupor, as it were, to see the spiritual meaning of what's really going on here, to lead them to higher things, that he, he still does it, you know, with a kind of... Uh, with a gentleness. He doesn't put their feet to the coals as much as, as he easily could do. And as I said, he worked a direct miracle for them uh, so that so that they could be profited. Because he could have just as easily said, what are you guys thinking right now? You having a hard time with this? I mean, he could have drawn it out of them in conversation. And that aspect of the miracle would have been lost. That ability for them to, to move from their spiritual blindness, you know, would have been eliminated. And so uh, I think this is, you know, something else that uh, that's sort of definitely going on because, uh, well, anyway, for for those sort of reasons. So 
Now, St. John will add sort of a point that, uh, as he sort of proceeds through the passage, that struck me as kind of funny. He sort of points out that, uh, really, if anyone had any reason to get upset in this passage, in this, uh, or in this event, it was the paralytic. Because the paralytic came, and, you know, what was he there for? Well, presumably he was there to be healed of his physical ailment. And uh, that was precisely what he didn't receive initially. He received this promise of the forgiveness of his sins. And, uh, but St. John says, even in this, um, where we see rather the, the Pharisees getting upset over, over this, rather than the paralytic, who had the right to be sort of disappointed maybe or upset, um, but even in this we see his own faith and humility that we don't see and we have not recorded any kind of outward distress, you know, by this fact, um, you know, but that it just sort of naturally proceeds from there to also him actually being healed. And, you know, you have to wonder if he himself, you know, started to become critical of our Lord in his heart, knowing that the Lord sees the thoughts of the heart, um, could, would and could this miracle really have taken place? Uh, you know, and so I think that's um, you know St. John points that out as sort of another another point, one that you know probably that we ought not to get upset about the ways in which we believe someone is being deprived of something, or in the way in which we think people are you know um, you know being slighted or or, or something like that, um, you know, but. Uh, Anyway, yeah, so uh, just that sort of aspect of things, but it, that, that in him we have this sort of, I guess, this great example of sort of patience uh, throughout the, the, whole, the whole situation. Um, now, St. John is also going to, he, he, he again, in this moment, is sort of turning his focus back to the correction of the, uh, of the Pharisees that's actually going on in this you know, until I read St. John's commentary, I guess I didn't really think how much this miracle is actually about the healing of the Pharisees, more so than it is even about the healing of the paralytic. Um, that that this whole um, that all of the miracles that take place in this passage are actually meant to be the occasion to heal spiritual illnesses, which, as St. John uh, rightly points out are the higher miracle. And so the man came looking for a physical healing. Instead, he was offered a spiritual healing, much more significant, even if he wouldn't have necessarily recognized it, and certainly not the people. Um, the Pharisees then sort of turn around to sort of rebuke him, and the Lord uses this as an opportunity even for them to try to, to heal their spiritual illnesses as well, these illnesses of, of their heart. Um, and he you know, is attempting to sort of, he, he, in the end, he uses this smaller miracle in order to try to work a greater miracle, the healing of souls. Um, it made me think of something that I had uh, heard in talk by Elder Zechariah of Essex. And he tells, the, he tells a story about Elder Sophroni. And he's going through and saying, you know, in our, in our time with Elder Sophroni, you know, we saw very many, him work very many miracles and, and these sort of amazing works of God right before his eyes. But he said, but it wasn't in those physical, miracles of physical healing that the elder rejoiced as much as it was in, in these healings of, of spiritual transformation. That for, the, for this, you know, great elder, uh, that the, the more significant miracle was when a person was spiritually healed of their illness rather than uh, physically healed. And I don't just mean, you know, demon possession or, or, or something like that. Um, I'll sort of, I'll read to you a, a, a bit of, of this account because uh, there's a, it's recorded in the book, The Enlargement of the Heart. And uh, you can find this sort of online, but he's sort of uh, speaking about the event, Elder Zacharias, about Elder Sophroni who was in the hospital with this particular person who he had prayed for the one time, uh, hadn't got healed. He was praying for him the second time. He still wasn't being healed. 
and it says, while the elder was reading the prayers the second time, he lifted up his stole from the sick man, his epithelium, and he said to him, look, we're not wonder workers, we're priests, and we pray for the reconciliation of people with God. And he continues, and somehow Father Sophroni was sad, and he did not want to pray anymore. Um, then the man looked at him with a smile and said, Yes, I'm not healed physically, but my soul is healed. And Elder Zechariah goes on to relate, because this man was a man who did not have faith. He doubted, and it was his wife and his mother-in-law who brought him almost by force to the monastery for Father Sophroni to read prayers for him. And I'm telling you, the elder says, Elder Zacharias, the joy of Father Sophroni for that was much greater than when he was reading prayers and miracles were happening in a very astonishing manner. And I think this is something that we can easily lose sight of, easily lose sight of in our, in our Christian life and feel that if we're not experiencing these sort of extravagant miracles that sometimes we hear people have experienced, that somehow we're missing out and you know it's just it's not it's not the case you know these aren't the kind of miracles that we're striving for the miracles we, we are striving for are miracles of transformation uh, of purification of illumination uh, and those and those sorts of things and St. John sort of sums up that point he says now what our Lord says is like this which seems too easier to bind up a disorganized body or to undo the sins of a soul. It's quite manifest to bind up a body, for by how much a soul is better than a body, by so much is the doing away sins a greater work than the transformation of the body. But because one miracle is unseen, that is, the spiritual healing, and the other is seen, I do the visible miracle too which although is an inferior thing, is easier for people to grasp and perceive, that the greater also and the unseen may thereby receive its proof. Thus by his works, St. John says, anticipating even now the revelation of what had been said by John the Baptist, that he taketh away the sins of the world. And so, you know, it's this point that people, you know, are, are impressed by these kind of uh, outward healings, but many times fail to recognize the deeper spiritual significance, strive after these things, but you know aren't looking sort of to the the sort of the deeper things, the the true miracles that we ought to be sort of looking for. And in the case of the people, uh, Saint John says, yes, it says they glorify God, which had given such power unto men. But he says that. Basically, they fail to recognize the true significance of Jesus Christ as the God-man precisely because they couldn't see past the sort of these physical miracles, these physical works of power. They were caught up in this kind of carnal uh, view of the world, a carnal view of things, and they couldn't see God working at a deeper level. And so, um, I, again, this is, you know... These are all things that in, in our day-to-day -day life were assailed by. You know, we say, I don't feel like God's present in my life. I feel like I have times when God's not there. You know, I, I wish I had more faith. Um, you know, I want to pray more, but I, my heart's not in it. Or, you know, I'm tired or, or this and that. Or I just don't feel like, I'm not sure if anyone hears me. You know, these are all a result of the fact that we're getting sort of stuck in the earthly, in the earthly world, in the sort of earthly kind of way of viewing things, and we're struggling to see the deeper spiritual significance that exists all around us every day in our in our day to day life. You know, in the beauty of God's creation, uh, you know, in in the sort of uh, these sort of small touches of grace, the peace that can you know that we can feel. Uh, after you know we uh, you know we did a, a good deed for someone, or we we gave alms, or you know we prayed for a, a certain amount of time. These are the kinds of things that we need to you know try to way uh, try to find a way to to sort of see 
so that we can kind of move deeper with our, our own lives. Um, because as St. John warns us, the real problem here with the Pharisees ultimately, he says, is that they use their disbelief as a cloak for their passions and for their own sins. And, um, and St. John actually goes on to warn us not to get caught up on uh, correcting others, basically, is what he's saying. Uh, he says most of the time it's just an excuse for us not to focus on ourselves. Um, it's an excuse for us to sort of have drama uh, in our lives so that things can feel exciting, maybe, and important, um, and not to sort of not be living with, with moderation and doing the sort of day-in and day-out kinds of things um, which maybe aren't that glamorous, but uh, are where we can experience real transformation in our lives step by step. You know, you don't become uh, a great athlete or uh, a very healthy person, you know, because you went out one day and ran, you know, half the day away. It's the little things that you do every day that sort of cumulative action which actually brings a person to the point of, you know, being transformed into this sort of athlete or this healthy person, and it's exactly the same in the, in the spiritual life. And so St. John kind of, uh, he warns us of this, and then he goes on to sort of end the whole thing by, uh, by pointing out the sort of love and the gentleness that our Lord um, displays uh, towards these Pharisees. And in this, this is where I really sort of felt that this was the deeper significance of what was going on in the passage, because... Um, our Lord is offering the Pharisees the spiritual healing. He wants to see them be healed. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, in, in this particular case, it seems as though you know, they didn't receive that healing. But he, he says that even when thou seest an enemy of the truth, wait on him, take care of him, lead him back into virtue by showing forth an excellent life, by applying speech that cannot be condemned, by bestowing attention and tender care, by trying every means of amendment in imitation of the best physicians. You know, these are the kinds of things that we, you know, we can strive for, even with those who hate us, yeah, even with our enemies. And this is the true sort of test of our, of our Christian life. The mark of a Christian is whether or not we have love. And this is what we, we're sort of striving for. Um, I'll just end with a, sort of a wonderful story I heard last evening. I was listening to this, uh, I don't know if you know the pod podcast, um, The Christian Message from Moscow. And uh, I was going back through some past episodes. They have years' worth of episodes. And it was uh, one I hadn't heard because it was just a text. And, um, and so I went sort of through and, and read it. And it was stories, I think, that this priest had collected maybe, uh, you know, maybe sort of an everyday saints kind of thing. Um, and one of the stories that he, he re related was about this man who uh, he had was you know a very hardcore communist uh, was uh, not a man of faith at all but not only that he was even a bad communist because he was such a drunk uh, he would run around on his wife all the time he would run around in front of her they said that they considered her almost a martyr because of what she sort of went through he said the man took no interest in his kids uh, at all except that he would occasionally beat them um, but that was sort of that was his fatherly care uh, and that's as far as it went uh, he alienated himself from all his friends he was kicked out of the communist party because they even confronted him about his immorality uh, and his, his drunkenness and this man meets up with him uh, many years later and he said I, I couldn't understand that this was the same person uh, I don't know how it would be possible and uh, he said what happened you know well, I see your things are going differently you know what? You know what's going on with you? Because he was gentle. He was going to church. He was, you know, he would completely given up those sorts of things. And he said, "Well, you see, once I was spewing out abuse at my son, uh, when all of a sudden he bowed before me and begged my forgiveness. At this point, my soul churned and I shuddered. I had been the bane of his childhood, while here he was begging my forgiveness." From that moment, something happened to me. I ceased drinking and fooling around. I found faith in God. I became a totally different person. And the narrator marveled at these words and says, if I hadn't heard them with my own ears, I never would have believed him. 
And I think this is ultimately sort of deep down what St. John is sort of finally exalting us with, uh, exhorting us with rather, with this, um, with this passage. To find this deeper spiritual meaning in our lives is going to be in very simple ways. To see beyond this sort of earthly human way of thinking and, and, to, and to think about things in this kind of heavenly manner that sort of defies explanation and defies uh, the experience of people, but is so graceful that it can completely transform an entire life of, uh, of sin and, uh, and hatred towards God. So uh, I think we'll leave it there through the prayers of St. John Chrysostom, our fathers and mothers. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Um, I, I won't speak about St. Elias. I didn't think I'd get to it, just because uh, I don't tend to speak short. But... Uh, if we have some time for questions, I'm, uh, I'm more than willing. Does anyone have a question they want to ask, uh, Father John? Well, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll start. Hopefully, you'll, you won't be shy. Um, Father John, um, one Father aspect. Matthew. Uh, Father Matthew, sorry. <laughs> um, one one aspect uh, that you didn't mention. No, well, you did mention, but the Saint John doesn't mention is the issue uh, of the paralytic's friends helping him hmm. and uh, you know I, I find in, in our day and age uh, that we're very selfish and self-centered that there is a misconception in the spiritual life that you know all I need to do is worry about myself but you know my neighbor I don't need to worry about and we see you know this beautiful example you know especially not only that they, they, they bring him to the Lord but you know they let him down through the roof right and all, you know the, the the you know even in those times you know the difficulty in doing all of that and showing you know and, and their faith as well. I wonder if you can comment on that briefly for us in in our you mentioned earlier you know daily lives of examples of things that we could be doing uh, to help one another in the spiritual life. Yeah, uh, you know the the first thing that we can do, uh, I think the sort of in some ways the easiest way uh, is you know. To be praying for people. First of all, we should be try to become people of prayer ourselves. Uh, you know, there is you know the, the teaching of the church is that we do first look inward, or we do primarily look inward, because it's only then that we are able actually to look outward with eyes that can kind of help people. But you know, these things have to be happening at the same time. It's not a sort of either or. Um, and so, the first thing we can do is, as much as possible, try to become people of prayer. People who, who look to God throughout their day and say things like glory to God, uh, you know, begin to see things a little bit differently. That will actually, I think, be the easiest way um, without a lot of effort, without a lot of kind of going out of your way or taking a lot of your time outside of what you're already kind of doing, as it were. Find a way to sort of make your day more about that. And, uh, and, and what I think you'll find is, first of all, you'll react to people differently your friends and your family, and um, we may think that that's a small way to help our neighbor, but actually, you know, if you think of your own lives, at least if I think of mine, you know, most of the conflict that I have, you know, in my life comes precisely because I'm not thinking of, um, you know, this, this, you know, these other people around me, especially family members and, and things like that, and not thinking in the sense of how, if I just curbed my behavior a little bit, if I just closed my mouth a little bit, how much easier I would make their life, how much easily you know their their struggle would be, and you see it has this sort of double effect already because um, by sort of becoming a person of prayer a little bit, or you know, and by altering my behavior, um, I'm changing. I can be changing them through prayer as I'm changing myself, um, but I'm also making things easier for them by you know being better myself, and uh, and also the the idea would be in these sort of ex extreme case of like this father and son, that they would see something in us and that they themselves would begin to change without us ever saying anything to them. And so I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, setting good examples, uh, not with the intention of setting an example for how other people ought to live, but because we do something right, we become, you know, as much as possible, we try to think and act as Christ would, um, and by doing that, I think we can. I think we'd be surprised how easy it is to help the people around us, uh, both spiritually and uh, well. There's no both spiritually and I was going to say, you know, in everyday life or something. That is the spiritual life. That is the spiritual warfare. You know, 
it's not you know going and standing in vigil. I mean, it's controlling your thoughts every moment. It's controlling your actions every moment. Everything we're reading in the Holy Fathers is stuff that, barring a few you know works in the Philokalia that are about reading, you know, or very particularly talking about your schedule of your day, they're all things that are, are meant to be done in the day-to-day -day life that you're in. Um, this kind of uh, spiritual stuff. So I, I think that would be the first way. That I'd probably I'd just contain it there because it's the easiest place to begin and the rest will kind of evolve naturally because if we're people of prayer and we're open to the will of God, then we'll learn how to do these other more sort of external things in terms of responding to the needs of other people. Anyone else? But yeah, feel free to ask a question, Father John. Either on this topic we discussed, or Father Matthew, sorry, I did it last week too, so it's okay. Um, either on this topic or something that you have a question you'd like to ask. Just turn the mic on there, Vasil. Oh, go ahead, Vasil. Um, from uh, what I uh, see in church um, every Sunday, thank God most of us have our health. And um, the parable that we uh, you spoke about, the parable of the paralytic, like I see like some people judge or gossip like when a sick person is in church like or on a wheelchair and some of them are like uh, they avoid uh, going to church because they're on a wheelchair because they're sick and you know I try, I try to speak to uh, some of my relatives like my relatives sick and uh, doesn't want to go not just because of that but he uh, is uh, unfaithful and he's didn't grow up uh, living the faith and uh, only twice I mentioned to uh, come to church or uh, visit uh, the homilies and the response was uh, completely uh, ignorant and uh, negative. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, kind of like a grudge against God. So um, I never really... Uh, forced and said uh, what you believe or what you think is wrong so I just left it at that and every now and then I bring up the topic you know, like you're welcome to come by or you're welcome to visit and uh, the response was kind of uh, not negative it was kind of like yeah 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 hmm. so I guess that that's kind of a question uh, how do you deal with that kind of situation and and in daily in church, you know, like we're, everywhere we go, uh, there's renovations in uh, McDonald's, Tim Hortons. There's wheelchair access. You press a button, there's wheelchair access. And, you know, there's churches that are being renovated right now, and there's no wheelchair access. You know, like the mm. architect people who build the churches are not thinking that, you know, they were building beautiful uh, churches huge properties and uh, they're not thinking about the people who want to go to the beautiful church that are on wheelchairs. Oh, that's my question or kind yeah. of like my complaint. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, to the second point, I think, uh, yeah, you know, especially when you have old churches or things like that, a lot of our old buildings aren't wheelchair accessible. These are things we ought to be making priorities as much as, you know, as much as humanly possible. Um, you know, obviously there's situations where it can be a little bit difficult, especially if the you know community doesn't actually have a church building. Um, you know, you can try as much as possible and ought to, you know, to, to sort of find these places. And, uh, you know, if anyway, let's just say it needs to be a priority. And I think legally, actually, in any new building, I think they need to be wheelchair accessible. I'm not 100% sure on the, on the rules of that, but um, I, I don't think... I don't think anyone can debate what you just said. Uh, that's 100% uh, the truth that we need to. Our facilities have to be suited, you know, to people being able to you know, to come. Um, to the other point, uh, I, I think you know, from the sounds of what you're saying, I think you're doing probably the right thing. 
you know, you know, mention things here and there, um, but you know, not pushing things. And when the person clearly shows they're not interested, then you just back off. Um, but as you've shown, uh, you know, you sort of, as it seems to me, over time, you know, the person is somewhat softened, and that's the kind of that's the reason why we do still, even if the first time or second time or third time, even they were quite abrupt about it or something, why we don't kind of we don't just sort of give them up, give up on them as it were. Um, but at the same time, we do have to respect their freedom, and uh, and we have to realize that we won't, there won't be any fruit from pushing uh, in that in that kind of way when you see that the walls are really up. Uh, again, the best thing you can do for for someone in that kind of situation is pray for them, uh, because the reality is God can easily open you know doors, as it were, or you know, in a moment when they are willing to sort of, you know, crack the door open a little bit, he can kind of flood them with uh, with grace. I, I heard a priest sort of describe how he had been praying for something intensely for two or three years and wasn't seeing any fruit, and he was so sort of disheartened by it, thinking all these years praying and the prayers are just wasted. And he was told by, uh, you know, uh, a spiritual guide, uh, it doesn't work that way, actually, that God kind of saves all these prayers, as it were, in a bank so that the moment that the person is actually open and opens that door a little bit, he'll flood them uh, with his grace and the fruit of all those prayers. So none of those things are ever wasted. Um, how those will manifest themselves and what, whether they'll manifest them the way that we maybe have in mind, well, that, you know, that's a totally different story. But... Um, you know, but at least in that sense, they're not wasted. So, you know, I think that's the the sort of the the right way to sort of proceed. And the other thing to remember is that if a person has some form of uh, you know great suffering or what is to them great suffering, um, you know, sometimes these are they're sensitive, they're you know they're wounds, and so if we if we touch them as it were by speaking directly on those subjects the person can react very harsh because they're wincing, as it were, spiritually wincing with pain. Um, and so in those particular cases, if especially if the person kind of shows that they're not, you know, willing or wanting to sort of pursue those as a topic, the best thing is, um, you know, is, is just to focus on other, other topics, other ways like, um, you know, if you interact with a particular person, you see that they, you know, they're really into, uh, you know, music or something. You know, maybe there's some ways you can drop a little bit of, uh, oh, this and that of Byzantine music is similar to that, or did you ever know that it began? It doesn't have to be like a, a lesson, a church history lesson or something, but just like little bits of information here. There sometimes can be the thing that can pique uh, someone's interest. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, Vicky, what first? Hi, Father. Hi. It's on. Okay. Forgive me for my ignorance, but is it true the paralyzed man um, was the uh, officer who turned Jesus in? Um, not that I've ever heard. Not in this particular. No. In this particular case, no. Was uh, hitting okay. him or like um, what is it? According to tradition, that he actually turned against him in the end. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's possible, not that I've sort of read off the top. I don't know that we knew the identity of this particular uh, paralytic after the fact, but there are figures, yeah, who we, you know, we. Uh, does it, does we this sound familiar? Or? I've just I've heard it, um, not per se from our spiritual father, or I, I haven't actually read it myself. So I've always it's always been. I think we've discussed this. Is mm -hmm. it another person? Okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't heard it in this particular context, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still, thanks for the questions. I mean, these, this is the only way we can kind of work these things out is if we ask these, because there are some that are related to uh, to figures that we learn more about. For example, uh, Saint uh, Longinus or whatever, who was the soldier who pierced uh, you know Christ's side with a the spear. These are things that we do know from from tradition, 
and from the Synexi and that we don't necessarily know directly from Scripture. Um, Father, uh, I have a very question. I'm going to try to condense it as much as I can. Sure. Um, this is and this is kind of just to add to what my friend was saying earlier with the um, uh, he's talking about the people in the church that uh, uh, tr yeah yeah um, there's also I kind of noticed another extreme on the flip side from a certain group of people and it's it, there's kind of a noticing a pattern from certain people that or confessing to one specific spiritual father. Um, it, it's kind of a, an issue of extremism where um, I guess because they confess to a certain person, they've, I guess, taken upon themselves to go out and uh, overly correct others or overly... Um, how do I say it? Uh, uh, I guess kind of put their business into other people's personal lives, where if they 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 ask questions sometimes, or they do certain things, or say certain things, or impose certain conditions on others. That uh, it's forgive me for saying this is really another business. Um, you know, there's even been instances where. I've heard from other people kind of telling me um, where they'd say things like, well, my spiritual father says this, so you kind of have to do this. And my understanding is this person's not my spiritual father, and the advice that was given to them was by their spiritual father, therefore I don't have to listen to it. I'm not obligated to listen to it because, you know what I mean, it wasn't given directly to me. And, uh, it, you know, I've noticed that it's kind of, in some instances, it's kind of causing divisions among certain p groups of people. Um, I, I just wondering how you deal with that, like, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, it's like, like for, it's, sorry, it's almost as if they're saying, well, I confess to this person, so therefore this person is holier than my spiritual father is better than your spiritual father, therefore you have to listen to me because I go to this person or your your whatever, you know. Maybe I'm not wording it right, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I know what you mean. You know, uh, again, it's hard to comment sort of generally about sort of situations like that because there's so many aspects that go into it depending on who the people are and what their motivations are. Um, but we can say sort of a, a few comments you know, to situations sort of like this. You know, the first thing is, um, well, as St. John said, you know, uh, yeah, we ought not to do that. From a, from a personal standpoint, we need to strive as much as possible, as I said, uh, or as the saint said, you know, not to spend all of our time watching what other people are doing, because as the, as the saint says, it's generally speaking just... Uh, you know, uh, an excuse to not focus on yourselves. Again, this is as my dogmatic professor, dogmatic theology professor in Thessaloniki said, was why people often, so often ask, can the non-Orthodox be saved? You know, and the point was, well, we just, I'll, we don't know who's, we don't know, you know, that we're going to be saved. Why would we be worrying about someone else's salvation? And so these sorts of questions. And he said it was just, uh, you know, basically it was a, it was an excuse not to focus on ourselves. And so I, I sort of agree with, you know, St. John here. You know, uh, again, that's speaking for us so that we don't fall into doing these things if we're one of the people that are sort of tempted to, to, to do that thing. Uh, okay, the point about, um, you know, what your spiritual father says to you and what my spiritual father says to me. Yeah, generally speaking, you ought not, none of us ought to be passing on what we are told in confession. Because, uh, or by our spiritual father, because the spiritual father can't defend themselves. Because, you know, if you say something to me in confession, I can't say anything about it. Um, and it happens all the time. Such and such a spiritual father says this, and he told me this in confession. And uh, if you know 
the spiritual father. You've, you know that the spiritual father didn't tell them that, you know, but this is what they took the spiritual father to be saying. Uh, you know, there was one case in particular where, you know, you sort of heard of it. It wasn't in a confession situation, so uh, one of the bystanders that was there sort of related it, but uh, the, the woman was taking it as though the spiritual father was giving her a blessing to just sort of move in with some man. And the, the spiritual father's point was more, look, I can't force you to do anything. You know, you know what the teaching of God is and the teaching of the church, but at the end of the day, you have to decide if you're going to follow it or not. And the person was about to skip off and said, oh, great, I have your blessing then to go do, you know, to go do what, what I think is right. Well, no, that's not what the spiritual father said, but that's what the person would have taken the spiritual father to have said had the spiritual father not been able to say, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Uh, and I, I think, that, you know, this is something that can happen very easily. Uh, in confession, uh, in the sense of, I don't know that it happens often, but I, I say it can happen easily. Um, but knowing that your father confessor can't repeat things, it's just best to keep those things to yourselves for the most part, um, for a whole host of, of different reasons. As a general rule, there's maybe times when advice that a spiritual father gives is of a general nature, and the spiritual father's made that clear. That's sort of a different matter um, to a certain extent. Still, you shouldn't be telling other people probably, you know, that they need to be doing this. Just like that spiritual father was going to say, you know the teaching of the church, you know the teaching of God on this, but I'm not going to compel you with a stick to do something or not do something. You know, that's the same in these other sort of situations. Um, you know, that said, we do need to find out we do have to be, I think, sometimes when people are bringing things up to us, we have a tendency to be oversensitive, especially if it hits a nerve, especially if it hits a temptation or a passion, especially if it's going to require more of us. Um, I think if we're honest with ourselves, I'm, from my personal experience anyway, of myself, uh, you know, when, when I hear something that, uh, you know, maybe is not something I want to hear, you know, you can you can sometimes, if you're paying attention, feel the walls go up. And so we do need to sort of be brutally honest, at least about our motives, in terms of why do I feel this way? Am I feeling this way because um, there's something not right about what's going on here in this situation, or the way I'm feeling pressured or something like that? Or, you know, is this because they've hit, you know, uh, they've hit a soft spot about something that is making my conscience feel guilty or, or something like that. You know, I'm, that's in all situations. I'm not, you know, just staying in this situation in general. As I said, the difficulty with answering this question is that it's such a general question from so many different aspects, but that's one of the aspects. So the first thing we need to do is not do it ourselves as much as possible. Worry about ourselves as much as possible. And uh, if your spiritual father tells you explicitly to go tell someone something, well, then that's a different story. Otherwise, err on the side of caution and witness to your faith, but, you know, don't be, beat people over the head with it just like our Lord did with his divinity. Um, um, yeah, we have to, we do have to sort of look at ourselves, I guess, uh, as much as possible in these situations and ask ourselves, why do I feel uncomfortable? Um, and if it's just because, you know, I'm, I don't want them nagging me, well then, it's a struggle. No one likes being nagged about and nagged at, and we just sort of wrestle with with that. But we, at the end of the day, we don't really let it into us, you know. But if we if we are looking inside of ourselves and we see, you know, uh, here I'll, I'll give you a, I'll, I'll confess to you guys, or <laughs> my own sort of confession, as it were, uh, you know. Um, I was sort of, you know, myself, you know, feeling a little bit drawn to, to watching some of World Cup soccer and paying maybe more attention to that. And, you know, you, you, you sort of, you're, you see one little bit, you sort of check in the news and you see, oh, wow. And then you, you kind of get stuck. And then the next game's on. Maybe I should spend more time on that one too. And, you know, and, and someone, I think very providentially, sent around a great homily by St. John Chrysostom, and had mentioned it in this sort of, uh, of a context, 
And, and this is where I could feel within myself this little bit of struggle. And uh, whether one, you know, whether I continued to watch or not continued to watch, or whether I decided it was right to do or not to do, um, that wasn't really what was so significant about it, as much as it was that I was aware of what hearing the word of a Holy Father was, uh, I was aware of what was going on in my soul. And in that particular moment, I could feel, maybe this is an attachment I'm having that isn't of God. Uh, not because it's necessary, I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong to do that. What I'm saying is my personal attachment to it maybe wasn't as healthy based on the way that I felt the words of the saint sort of uh, affecting me. And so um, I don't know if that sort of, uh, you know, helps at least to, to the kinds of things that I'm saying when we're looking at ourselves. You, you know, it's very hard to say this is right and that is wrong. Yes, we have church teaching that does that, but for, for a host of other activities, it falls under what St. Paul says, um, all is permissible, but not all is profitable. And that's where a lot of these things, these things fall, fall, you know, where things fall in. And the fact of the matter is, what's possible for one person isn't necessarily what's possible for another. So Elder Joseph the Hesychus, for example, was able to do extreme, extreme forms of self-denial, not all of which are explicitly called for, you know, by the gospel, but he he was willing to give more and more and more because he felt that he could, you know. But some other person maybe they can't do that. And so, you know, that's the other aspect of it, and that's why the spiritual father is really important in this situation, why it's hard to say you must do this and you must do that. If you have a, if someone's saying you must do this or that, you know, you can always go to your spiritual father and, and you know, and speak to them about it. But again, being very careful not to judge the other person's spiritual father because we don't really know what the other person's spiritual father actually said, you know. That's that's a that's a general maybe I don't know if that uh, is enough. My uh my 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 concern is that um a lot of these and it's not just one person it's a group of people and they're all doing the same thing. My concern is that uh, they without realizing it they're falling into vain glory and they're overly it's like you know your spiritual father tells you something specifically to do. Or you know you've been with your spiritual father a certain period of time, and you're struggling to be obedient, and now all of a sudden a large group of people are kind of coming along and telling you no 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 no, trying to kind of steer you away, and it's like it, it's causing a lot of confusion. You know, it's especially with people who are new to the faith, especially with people who don't, who are maybe not spiritually strong enough, you know, and they don't know any better and. They, you know, like I've heard instances where this one particular woman was talking to me one time. She says, somebody said to me that if I don't do this and that, their so-and-so's spiritual father told them that I'm going to burn in hell. And I'm like, what? So-and-so told you this? And they wouldn't tell me the name of the person, but it's like, yeah, my spiritual father says this. Therefore, what he says goes, you know, and, you know, and, there, and this woman has a spiritual father. It's not the same spiritual father as the person who gave them this advice, but because it's not the same person, what is it? Not holy enough, or like, you know, like. Yeah, the first thing I would, I would guess, I would say to that is one, I wouldn't, you know, the fact of the matter is whether they're falling into vainglory or not, isn't really a big. I mean, it's an issue for them, but it's not an issue for you, especially if it's causing the problems. So what you can do is pray for those people, both for you to be illumined and for them to be illumined. That's the sort of best way to deal with any situation, anyway. Um, you know, in in terms of these sort of you know, concerns again about uh, you know them having an effect on other people or causing turmoil for other people. Well, we do have to be sort of cautious of of these kinds of things. Um, um, you know, but some of it is too that you you sort of deal with it on a situation to situation basis. Um, I don't think there's any way to sort of like as a general rule sort of fix these. You know, to to make this sort of go away or something like that, other than through prayer, you know. Um, and we have to ask ourselves: Is it my responsibility to make it go away anyway? Maybe it's not. You know, if God's calling me to do that or something, well, I'd have to have pretty, you know, I'd have to have clear direction. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. I think that's the other thing: is sometimes, um, for good reasons, oftentimes we try to take on struggles that really we don't need to take on. 
even though we see this happening, you know, there's other people that can that can uh, sort of help to resolve the situation. So we do have to gauge very seriously, you know, which situations we need to and and not. Um, and at the same time, we can look at these people also and say, glory to God, they have such zeal. Even if it is zeal without knowledge, in, in some cases, um, you know, uh, it, to see a person who who is is struggling and trying to care about salvation, even if they're not quite doing it in the right way, um, this is something that is, you know, in its root, is a good thing. And so we should, you know, give glory to God for that, and then pray that God directs it in the right way. It's much harder to deal in many ways with a person who wants nothing to do with God. At least they think that they they're trying to follow, you know, follow God, and and follow a dedicated kind of life. And so from that perspective, um, God would have something to work with, let's say, or at least you know our prayers. We can we can use those things to help encourage ourselves to not fall into judgment. Because a lot of the times when we say these people are judging me, uh, we're passing judgment on them as well. <laughs> um, you know, we're doing the same thing, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, we we uh, when someone's doing more or what they perceive to be doing more, um, you know, it's it's really easy for us to feel like you know they're judging us for doing less. And not realizing that we can easily fall into the sort of opposite thing, um, rather than saying what they do is for them, what I do is for me, or or trying to learn from them and say, well, maybe I, I could increase this then, or or something. You know, I, again, it all depends on a, on what the situation is. We we're talking too vague to really to really go too much further. But again, if we look inward and and focus on ourselves first and foremost, and try to find ways in which we can accept the responsibility, or ways in which we can find to glorify God uh, in other people's actions, um, then ultimately that'll just that'll be the best way for us to deal with anything and for us to transform the world. Father Bather, we uh, we should wrap up. We, we want to thank you again for uh, spending your time with us and sharing uh, thoughts of uh, St. John Chrysostom as well as your own and for us to share our experiences. Um, as we can see from our conversation, we can obviously uh, look at our own spiritual state, that we have our own spiritual paralysis uh, to, to work on, and that we should ask the Lord uh, not only just to forgive us of our sins, but also to heal us of our spiritual paralysis so we can become healthy, so we can become those good examples that God and, and people of goodwill need, especially in our, in our trying times. If we could just ask for a final prayer, it would be great. Thank you. Fair Well, thou who at all times and at every hour in heaven and on earth art worshipped and glorified, O Christ God, who art long suffering, plenteous in mercy, most compassionate, who lovest the righteous and has mercy on sinners, who callest all men to salvation, who promise the good things to come. Receive all that our prayers of this hour and guide our life toward thy commandments, sanctify our souls, make chaste our bodies, correct our thoughts, purify our intentions, and deliver us from every sorrow, evil, and pain. Compass us about with thy holy angels, that guarded and guided by their array we may attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of thy unapproachable glory. The blessed art thou unto the ages of ages. Amen. Okay, Papa, thank you again. Good night, everyone.